Well, good morning once again, and uh, here we are, the very last study in the book of Micah. And uh, you might be saying, well, we're glad we're coming to the end of the book, but I pray that uh, in the days and the weeks, the months that lie ahead, that you'll reflect and review on this wonderful small book of prophecy that has so much to teach each and every one of us. We'll start with a word of prayer. We'll read the text that we're going to look at today. That's Micah 7, starting at verse 8. Uh, and then we get into the final study in this wonderful book. So let's come before the Lord in prayer before we do anything else. Eternal God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we look back into the Old Testament, we see that so much points, in fact, everything points to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to his character, nature, attributes, and what he has done for each one of us. We thank you that you're a God who never changes that Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so teach us these principles that were in place 700 years before the birth of Christ, and yet are very applicable to the 21st century in which we live. So be with us, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start in verse 7. Uh, we, we looked at that the last time, we were here last week, uh, and then we'll pick it up in verse 8 and go through to the end. But let me read once again verse 7, what it says. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation, and my God will hear me. That is very important as we move into the final section. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her, who said to me, where is your God? My eyes will see her, and now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. In the day when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from a city and from the fortified cities, and from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for their fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days of old, when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The nation shall see and be ashamed of all their might, and they shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea and you will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Seems like almost an anti anticlimax as we get into the last section. Uh, you would probably think after verse 20 there would be more to come. But let me remind you as we've studied this book that God is setting out the way he deals with his people. When there is a need to remind them or show them the sins, uh, then God will do that. He will also show the remedy, which begins with repentance. Because God has, as we saw in the earlier chapters, prepared a great world for the future. When he will set up his kingdom in this earth and Jesus Christ will rule and reign. And of course, it will be a kingdom that you and I as believers in him will be part of. But until that time, of course, we need to understand and be aware of the fact that we need to continually seek his face to walk with him day after day. Let me just remind you of the last verse we saw last week where in verse 7 he said that we would look to the Lord, we would wait on the Lord, and God will speak to us. 
just to remind you again, the resolution of faith, I will look. Then the resolutions of patience, I will wait. And the confidence of hope that we have, God will hear. Timeless truths for each and every one of us. Look to the Lord, learn to wait in the Lord, because God does hear and God will answer. Now, of course, as we move on from this into the final section, God's enemies, as again we saw in a previous chapter, were rejoicing over the fall of God's people. And uh, they were sneering, scorning, and in their personal opinions, you know, God virtually didn't have any relevance for the people that he called his own. And yet, after all that God has done, we have a message for the enemy. Do not rejoice over me, O enemy. When I fall, I will arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord, rightfully so, because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case. What a great thing it is. Jesus Christ is our advocate. Until he pleads our case and executes justice for me, he will bring me forth to the light and I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see and shame will cover her and said to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. You see, God has a plan to maintain the interests of his people and to secure the triumph of his people. You know, it's a sad situation when God's people are troubled by the enemy. You know, he mentions here the fact that, you know, they're cast into trouble when I fall. You know, none of us is immune from the temptations that come. All are liable to fall, no matter how strong they might be. We've seen that in recent days with some very well-known and we thought very strong believers, but they fell because there is always sin within. Yes, it's been pardoned, it's been forgiven, but until we get to heaven, we're going to be susceptible to the sin around us and that affects our life. So sin within, there is temptation without. And yet again, we're reminded in the New Testament there is no temptation such as is common to man that God will not provide a way of escape. Let me remind you, temptation is not the sin. It's giving in to temptation. But this need not be fatal because we have hope in Jesus Christ our saviour and our redeemer. So they cast into trouble. They're suffering in darkness. Sometimes we get through dark periods in our life and maybe doubts, there may be depressions. It seems like clouds come over us. It seems perhaps even at times that friends desert us. It may seem like there's a shadow actually hiding God. And we can be mocked by the world around us, mocked by the enemy. Insults, reproach. And as I've said many, many times, the world indeed rejoices when a Christian falls. And therefore we should do all that we can to be that man or that woman that will stand strong, rely on the strength of God and the power of his Holy Spirit. But as the verse tells us, there is great hope for God's people. The Lord is the light you know, we're chastened, as Paul reminds us in Hebrews, but not given up on. Lifted up from trouble, I will arise. Somebody once said, the sinner lies where he falls. A just man rises. And so it's a sad situation when we're mocked and troubled by the enemy. But we are enlightened in the darkness. Shadows will disperse. Restoration is guaranteed after repentance. Light in the darkness, the Lord is a light. We see that in so many verses in scripture. And it's a light when we go through these dark spiritual experiences, when faith is hard and unbelief in our life is very strong. The Lord can be a light to us. When we don't know the way ahead, and there seems to be darkness ahead, and we don't know which direction to take, the Lord will shine on our path and give us that direction. Even when we face 
death. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because even in the darkness of dying, God is still a uh, light. And so Micah reminds them that there is sure triumph. The enemy's joy will be turned into shame. And the deliverance from the enemy will indeed be complete. So don't forget, trials must be expected, but they will be temporary. Trials will fulfill their purpose. We don't have time this morning. Read the first chapter of James. There is a purpose in trials, and they should be endured with hope and patience because you will come out the other side. In verses 11 and 12, it says, In the day when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree will go forth far and wide, and in that day they will come to you from Assyria and fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, that's the the, 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 the great river Nile, and then from sea to sea, the Mediterranean Sea, mountain to mountain, from all over. We've already seen this in the previous chapter, a glorious day, a day of deliverance from bondage, a day of God's people gathering together, a day when there will be peaceful restoration. But here's an interesting thing. The prophet Micah goes on and he says, and yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. That's the key, for the fruit of their deeds. You see, the land was cursed because of the sin of its inhabitants. Are we back before the children of Israel come in? The Amorites, the Hittites, and so on. But when God's people turned their back in God, the land didn't function as God intended it to. Salvation came, but the land was still desolate. Why? You see, the simple answer is sometimes you cannot undo the consequences of sin. Sin can be forgiven, guaranteed. But sometimes the consequences will still be around to face. I think the classic example would be somebody becoming pregnant through an affair or an unmarried situation. God can forgive a sin, but he won't undo the consequence of that sin. And you need to understand that. We're not home yet, and the enemy will still cause us problems. But then Micah cries out and says, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage. They dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days of old. This is Micah's prayer for God's people. It's all about the work of God and the people of God. The people of God are his favoured people. They're called the flock of God. We could say so much more, but we would still be in Micah in six months' time. God takes pleasure in his people. He leads us. He leads us by the word, and he leads us by his spirit. And yes, we're healed, and we're restored, and we are forgiven. He reminds them, as in the days of old, when you come out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. You see, this is God's answer to Micah's prayer, reminding Micah as to what he, the Lord, had already done and would do in the future. Because his people were a separated people. Remember, God chose them not because they were better or more intelligent or suave or sophisticated he chose these people to do a work in them that they might be a testimony, a light to others. But they're a separated people. And we should be a separated people today. So many times Christians just want to merge in with the world. But not only are we a separated people, we are a protected people. The Lord is my shield and my defender. And we're also an enriched people. According to the riches of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. How rich do you think he is? And you and I are enriched, perhaps not materially, but in the areas that matter the most spiritually, in so many ways. Verses 16 and 17, the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might 
they shall put their hand over their mouth, their ears shall be deaf, they shall lick the dust like a serpent, they shall crawl out from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear, listen, because of you. Yes, the enemy has mocked. The world has turned itself against God without any fear. They've taken the people of God and persecuted them, marginalized them, and done so many things. But the day is coming when they will be afraid of the Lord their God, and they will fear you. You see, the Lord continues to tell Micah what he has not only done, but what he will do. He will share blessings on his people. And part of that blessing will be the overthrow of the enemy. And the enemy will be frustrated in their purpose. They will be silenced in their slander against the people of God. They will be humbled in the pride that they have shown for many millennium. And ultimately, they'll be exposed in their folly. What a wonderful answer to prayer. And then Micah says, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. What a great verse. He delights in mercy. Remember way, way back, we looked at three aspects of sin, sin, transgression, iniquity, and give a definition for each one of these. But you know, God is a merciful God. He delights in mercy. There is no pardon like God's pardon. Completely and utterly merciful to each one of us. Not giving us what we deserve, but instead sharing his grace upon us day after day after day. You see, God's mercy is based on God's nature. He is a merciful God. In fact, we could say he wouldn't be God if he didn't have mercy. God's mercy is based on God's work. And of course, that was done on the cross of Calvary. Your mercy should be our greatest aim as we seek to be like him. Because of his righteous mercy, we can trust God at all times. And that should encourage us to show mercy to others. And as we show mercy to others, they will trust us. They will listen to what we have to say as we reason about the greatness and the goodness and the uniqueness of our God. But so often they turn away because we are unmerciful. Who indeed is a God like you? There is no pardon like his. It's complete, full stop. And there is no pardon like his method of giving us that pardon. The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross has always been at the very centre and always will be of our faith because it was on that cross when Jesus died that our sins were forgiven and that the walls that separated us from God were broken down as we received Christ into our life and we became part of the family of God and then led by the spirit of God and the word of God into maturity all because of the cross there's so much again we could say but listen Verse 19 and 20, to close off the book, he will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. You have cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Sounds like an abrupt ending. But you know something? It's all about exalting, exalting God for his mercy. And you really can't put a full stop there because his mercy goes beyond chapter 7, verse 20, because it's for all ages to all people. And so very briefly this morning, we come again to the end of another book, the book of Micah. 
And it's been a pleasure to study this together. But I do encourage you, you know, sometimes you study a book, you read it, and then, you know, six months later, a year, you've almost forgotten what it's about. It only takes a short time to read. Read it again and again and again. And allow the truths that we have learned to bless your life and to take you forward from now on. God bless you. God be with you. God fill you afresh with his Holy Spirit as he protects you and pardons you and provides for you in the days that lie ahead. God bless you.